Thank you. Thank you to the, the music team as well. Um, well. What a week it's been, eh? A big, big week. When I was about six years old, uh, I was introduced to the game of chess. A few excited gasps in the audience. Um, now, for a while, it was a great passion of mine. And, um, and I used to play it all the time. I used to think about it all the time. Um, but gradually, and particularly into my teenage years, I began to get a bit bored and uh, got interested in football and other things. And, um, and only played chess occasionally after, after that. Um, but 2020 was a big year in the world of chess for a couple of reasons. Um, if you've got Netflix, you might have seen a program called The Queen's Gambit. It was an incredibly popular program on Netflix um, about a fictional female chess champion uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, the, the show became hugely popular and introduced the game of chess to a whole new audience. And secondly, when lockdown happened, uh, the first lockdown, uh, many, many people, myself included, kind of rediscovered, um, with all the limitations around, um, rediscovered, perhaps for nostalgic reasons as well, this, uh, the game of chess. And um, now there are so many online resources and platforms to help you play and to learn. And it's now really easy to, to play against anyone uh, from anywhere in the world. And... Um, uh, and to, to learn and get better as well in a way that um, I couldn't when I was a kid. I was given a chess computer when I was about eight. So this is like in the early 1980s. So you can imagine how, what the computers were like. It, it took 24 hours for the computer to make a move. <laughs> That's, that says something about the technology. Now you can have 30 second games of chess. The whole game has to happen in 30 seconds. So technology has moved on somewhat. And, um, and there are, there are um, chess players now. Some of the most famous chess players in the world now have their own YouTube channels. There's a constant stream uh, of activity. The most popular YouTuber, a uh, guy who's based in New York, at the beginning of lockdown had around uh, 80,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, and now he has 1.3 million subscribers, videos that he makes. This might just be him playing or commenting on other people's games. They can get half a million hits within 24 hours. Um, chess is a big deal, people. Uh, and this week has been big. I'm sure you're all aware this, was the, this week has been the World Chess Championships. Now, every couple of years, the reigning chess champion Will, will play against a challenger who's, had, who's spent months preparing and over the preceding year or so has played in a number of tournaments to see who will come out and be the challenger. And, um, and this week, Magnus Carlsen, the reigning champion, retained his title against Yam Napamachi from Russia. This is a big story. This was big news. Last Friday, game number six, they play up to 14 games. It went on for eight hours. And uh, there was like 20, 30 minutes between some moves. And you could, you could watch the coverage of this. Several different websites were covering it, where people would talk for all that time about what moves they might play. And um, some of you, this, this might not seem that exciting, but some of us were at the edge of our seats. And. Um, and so this was a big week. This was a big story. Magnus Carlsen is considered to be the GOAT. That is the greatest of all time. He's been described as the Mozart of chess. Um, his mind is incredible. Uh, if you look on YouTube, there is a video of him playing simultaneously against 10 other people blindfolded. Um, that's what his mind is like. Incredible. So this has been a really big week. Or has it? Um, how many here were aware that this was going on? Put your hand up if you were aware this was going on. Oh, Steve, that doesn't count because I told you about it. <laughs> 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 it 
Steve has been tolerating my enthusiasm <laughs> over the last week or so. Well, for chess enthusiasts, this has been the biggest week of the year. But is it a big story? Is it big news? Has it been a big week? What does it matter if you don't like chess? Is it a big story or a small story? Is it even a story at all? And you're probably thinking, well, Tim, I'm happy for you. <laughs> uh, it's big news for you, but not for me. It's got nothing to do with me. It has no impact on my life at all. And this leads, strangely enough, um, to our Bible study, our Bible <laughs> passage this morning. It's true, it does. Um, our passage this morning focuses on Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem, and it's part of the, one of the accounts of the events around Jesus' birth given to us in the Bible. But before you hear it, I want you to ask yourself, is this a big story or a small story? Is it front page news or, or does it not even get into the news at all? Now, I'm going to read this story from, from this copy of Luke's Gospel. Um, this Luke's account of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it's part of the Bible, but um, you can pick up a copy of this individual copy of the book uh, outside near the entrance. This is where I got this one from. Um, but I want you to think as I read, is this a big story or a small story? Well, let's read and find out, and it may appear on the screen as well. Thank you, Ian. This is uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and I'll just read the first few to begin with. And we read, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. Well, there's talk of, of Caesar Augustus here, so maybe this is a big story. Uh, the leader of the Roman Empire, he wants to know how big his empire is, probably to control it, probably for taxation. And so he has everyone organised so they can be counted and registered. And so our, our story does start big, doesn't it? The most powerful person in the world at the time. It feels like a big story, doesn't it? An emperor disrupting people's lives, ordering people around like figures on a, well, a chessboard. Um, everyone under his rule, everyone for his own benefit. But now the passage moves on to what might seem like a much smaller story. And so we read on in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Or you might be more familiar with the wording, there was no room for him at the inn. So, is this a big story or a little story? Well, compared to the average nativity, and perhaps uh, some of you have been at, at children or grandchildren's nativities this week at school, um, Luke spends very little time describing the birth, doesn't it? It's almost a sort of throwaway comment. And we see in this passage the action move from, from the great Caesar to Joseph, who goes to his ancestral town because Caesar's required it of him. He's one of those chess pieces, isn't he? Uh, for the census. And he takes Mary with him, who's expecting a baby. And while they're in Bethlehem, the time comes for that baby to be born. And we read, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. 
Now, there are a couple of surprises, uh, one much bigger than the other. Let's start with the, the smaller surprise. Uh, now, there is some debate about this, but contrary to traditional nativity scenes, um, the idea that the couple went from hotel to hotel uh, asking it was, was there any room, that's not actually in the Bible. Um, they were, and the tradition has it that they went around, they were told no, these, these callous people throwing, denying entry to this um, heavily pregnant woman. Um, seems very callous, doesn't it? Um, and all they, the only option they had available was someone saying, well, you can't stay here, but we've got a stable out the back. Um, is that what happened? Well, it seems actually likely that they would have been staying with relatives. The New Testament scholar Ian Paul, who writes a very, um, a very popular blog, points out that actually, because Joseph was returning to his ancestral home, because of the culture of hospitality at that time and in that part of the world, all he ha- would have had to have done was turn up at even a distant relative and say, I am Joseph, son of whoever, and they would have been obliged to take him in. It just would have been unthinkable that they would turn him away. So it's probably not the case that he was sort of at some sort of distant stable out the back. And houses at that time would have, would have had similar structures to each other. And it's suggested that uh, the average house that they might have stayed in There would have been a sort of a main room, imagine this stage, but a lot smaller. And then there would have been some steps up to a larger room that would have been the guest room. So when it says there was no no room, there was no guest room. So it could well have been that by the time they arrived in Bethlehem, that guest room was already being used by some other guests. There would have been a lot of people traveling to Bethlehem. And so the situation was probably that they turned up at the door of a, a relative and the relative said, well, there's no, there's no guest room for you. That's already being occupied. So actually, probably the people in that house would have given up their own main room for Mary and Joseph. That makes sense to me of, of the culture of the time, but also um, the, the welcome that a heavily pregnant woman would have received. Now, the other thing you need to know about houses at that time were, um, if you imagine this section of the stage was the the main room, there's a step down and where Sam is sitting, apologies, Sam, that would have been where the animals were. (laughs) Um, In fact, all of you would have been in the stable part, but a much smaller, a much smaller part of the room. And along the sort of edge, there would have been steps down to that sort of animal part. Um, and there would have been sort of, I don't know, cut up holes or, or something that would have contained the food for the animals. Now, when we, we had our second baby, uh, uh, we, um, it's a tiring time. <laughs> Those first few nights particularly, and, and Hannah and I were, were taking it in turns um, and so I would sleep in, in our spare room and uh, at, I don't know, four or five o'clock in the morning, um, Hannah would pass the baby to me and, um, and uh, I'd be so tired and finally he would get to sleep. And, but the Moses basket was in, was in the room Hannah was in. And, uh, but I had this clever idea, our washing basket <laughs> was, was in the spare room and so I, I made it comfy, and then I would put, put him in there. And he was perfectly safe and fine. And that was, that was what I could find, because um, I didn't have a Moses basket in the room. Um, so I put him in there, and he'd sleep happily for a few hours. Now, maybe something like that happened. Um, they didn't have a Moses basket. But what they did have in that room was a manger. And that provided a a safe, comfortable place to put Jesus, to put the baby. So possibly that's what happened, and that makes sense of the fairly limited detail we get 
in the Bible stories. So maybe that's a surprise that, um, that the traditional scenes we have aren't quite accurate. You might say, well, what does it matter? Well, it seems that this is a very ordinary picture. This is a picture of, of a family, um, of a baby being born in the midst of a slightly unusual situation of family, but family nevertheless. Well, is this a big story then or a small story? Is this an emperor-sized story, if you like, or a baby-sized story? It all seems quite unremarkable, doesn't it? It seems quite small. Well, before this part in the story, in, in Luke's story, he begins to prepare us for how big this story might actually be. He describes the circumstances of the baby's conception. Joseph was not involved. That this baby somehow came about through the work of God in, in the womb of Mary. And we're promised, we're told before our part of the story here, that this baby would be a deliverer, a rescuer of Israel, would come and bring about rescue and forgiveness for broken and rebellious humanity. And after our passage today, after that story, is the account of angels appearing to the shepherds. I actually preached on that passage last year. So if you want part two, you can find that on YouTube. And, and the angels declare, a saviour has been born to you. Christ the Lord, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So is this a big story or a small story? Well, interestingly, there's an inscription from before the birth of Jesus that celebrated the good news of the birth of the emperor that said he was saviour of the world. And it seems like Luke is using the emperor actually as a, as a pawn in his play at all. That um, Caesar, the most powerful person in the world, was actually a bit part player in God's greater purposes, in God's greater story. And Caesar, who was the very model of human power, was actually a bit part player in God's greater plan. Plans And so this story doesn't seem so ordinary after all, does it? And like my attempts, I think largely unsuccessful attempts to convince you that this was a big week because of the chess. Um, we might ask, is the birth of Jesus a big story for some? I'm happy for you, Tim, that, that the birth of Jesus is a big story for you. Maybe for those in the Christian community, it's a big story for us. But, but actually, I'm not into that. I'm not into chess and I'm not into church. So this isn't a big story. Neither are big stories for me, but I'm happy for you. Is that all we can say? Is it a story for those who are into that sort of thing? You can sort of smile benignly and you know, let you get on with it. Is it a story that can sit comfortably at the edges of our lives and crop up once a year maybe and then fade into the background again when the lights go down and we go back to work? Well, this leads to our second much bigger surprise about this story. And this is the biggest surprise of all perhaps, is that if Luke's account of Jesus' birth in this story is true. It's not just a, a big story, it's the biggest. It's wrapped up into the big story told to us throughout the whole Bible of God's purposes to bring healing, to bring forgiveness, to bring reconciliation to the world. And if Luke's account of Jesus is true, then what he is saying, this is not a story we can just pick up and put down and shrug off. It's not just a story for those who are enthusiastic about it. It's actually a story that is for everyone. It's a big story that invites us all to be part of it. It's a story that requires something 
of us. So we can't say, well, how does this story fit into my life? You you asked that perhaps when I was talking about the chess news this week. Well, how does this story fit into my life? Well, it doesn't. And even if you're enthusiastic about it, it might fit into your life a little bit, but, but that's all it requires of you. But you can't say that of the Jesus story. We can't say, well, how does this story fit into my life? We actually need to ask, well, how does my life fit into this story? Well, let me finish with three suggestions about how we can follow up in this story before I hand over to the worship team. Firstly, whether you know this story really well or not well at all, don't forget that the birth of Jesus isn't an acute or marginal event. It's an invitation to something so much bigger than ourselves, isn't it? And secondly, if you've never actually read an account of the life of Jesus before, if, if your exposure to this story is through school assemblies and nativities, well, why, don't, why not take a copy of Luke's Gospel or read it online uh, over Christmas, the Christmas period? Why not find out for yourself all that Luke has to say about Jesus and not just a short story about his birth. And thirdly and finally, if you would like to explore what this story means and what it means to get in on this story um, that we're being invited into, you might want to talk to someone about that. As well as reading, uh, say, a Gospel of Luke, you might want to talk to uh, someone uh, either either online or, or in person. You might want to consider, say, the Christianity Explored course that we sometimes run here at church, where we give people a chance to sort of explore that story and explore the claims that that story has on us. And we'd be very happy to give you details about that. Now, just to finish, I've done some soul-searching, and I can now admit that maybe the news about Magnus Carlsen's victory this week perhaps doesn't matter for everyone, perhaps doesn't require anything from us. But the story of Jesus will not let us get away with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you you stepped down into earth as as we sang. Lord, this is such a familiar story for so many of us. And we pray that you would restore the the awe and wonder of that fact. And we do pray as well for those for whom this is news, this is new. Or the idea that this might have a claim on our lives might be new. And we pray for, for, for those hearing this story in a new light perhaps. We pray that you would speak to them. Please speak to us. May we encounter this story, even for the first time. And may that transform us. Please give us a hunger and a a thirst and enthusiasm for the really big things. uh, For you and what your story has to say and how it invites us into an encounter with you. Amen.